And one of the things I get the most when it when people relate back to the brand and actually start to speak on the brand is is this is the reminiscence of hey man I still remember when you used to put your tripod up in your office and do those whiteboard videos because yeah. like if you look at you know a YouTube landing page like you would look at like a Netflix series right you sort of see the evolution of the show in the thumbnails itself like no different than uh, sometimes I'll just on a long flight I'll just scroll and scroll back through my Instagram and try to like re- re- retrace my steps of how the fuck I got here in the last five or six years and I see the evolution just like one quick snapshot at a time it's like do you feel as if quality has to scale with the story? I think it's I think it's relative to the brand, right? So I'll give you an example. I used to watch video, or I remember videos of yourself on YouTube, like in in an office with like a whiteboard or or something like that, and that was like real early days. And I I remember it's actually I, I remember when we were first started talking, we hadn't met yet, and that was like my research that was kind of like cool like oh I was watching in a sense you know in the sense that you know you kind of like when you start to engage with someone on the internet you kind of check out their stuff you're, you're doing that and I think it's like the Sam Sul- Sam Sulek is that his name yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like that kind of thing right in terms of but as soon as you click into prescript and that starts to grow it's a different story because you want a particular perception of your brand mm. mm-hmm. Right. Whereas an in, on an individual level in the early days, you're not thinking about that. There's less parameters. And that's the that's the thing that I think is changing at the moment. Right. Is that what everyone's trying to do is humanize their brand. It's what Nike did 20 years before anyone even thought about it, is that we don't want it. We don't want people to connect with a logo. We want people to connect with people and as you grow a brand and you get larger and larger and larger, that's harder to do in the old way of building a brand, right? And if you think about it, like the brands that are irrelevant now is because there's no, you know, they haven't been humanized. Like I don't feel anything to you. There's no loyalty, right? And I think that's what comes from uh, connecting with individuals, you know? And so my point with that is, is like, the biggest challenge for brands now is as they get bigger, bigger, you know, and they grow and, and is to keep that human element to it. And I think, I think that's why it's not going to just be the high res, the, the, the high fi you know, um, high res stuff. I think it's going to be a mixture of both and it's about how you want to be perceived. But do you feel like coming? Cause I feel as if the creator forced the corporate to humanize right and accelerated that like i still think we'd be in a world where where apple and nike are you know the superlatives of brand perspective worldwide i just feel like the conversation about other corporations like rapidly and successfully in most cases humanizing their brand is on the direct uh coattails of creators coming up and actually making a personal brand more corporate right because at a certain point like we're finding this at scale in our business where they're just immutable laws of business that you have to adhere to at scale, right? There's, I don't know if you've ever read the book uh, Scale by Jeffrey West. Like, there are immutable laws of scale in the universe. And a lot of it helps explain to a creator, like, our, like I would put ourselves reluctantly in that category, at least in the early days. <laughs> right? Matt's yeah. like, nah, nah, yeah, nah. Yeah. I, I didn't use the <laughs> I don't word. Don't call me that. Yeah, I, I didn't use the I word. Um, but there are things that we're doing now in the business that, you know, are adopting very real corporate structures. Like, I remember someone used the word org chart to me. They said the word org chart to me three years ago, and I Google searched it. And now I probably said the word org chart 12 times in the last 24 hours. Do you see that, do creators looking maybe from a creator moving towards a brand and brand trying to have that creator element, like do you feel as if creators need to, they need to, um, they need to corporate corporatized like does Sam Sulek have a glass ceiling on his ability to scale because he's running around with an iPhone at a certain point liver king I think would be a great example of this right the deliberate production value out of the gate to accelerate his brand quickly to a really high level yeah like do you feel as if a creator can can hit that corporate level of you know top line revenue without having this you know follow and scale and complexity yeah but I I, I would say that with even with liver king that is not the basis of why his brand grew, 
right? Like, like in terms of like, yeah, he probably had high quality from day one, but like the guy was so fucking outrageous that that's why his brand grew, right? So, so a like, shock factor. like I don't, I don't think that that, like the, the quality of his content is why he grew. I would say that it's like the guy was fucking lying out of his teeth and he was outrageous <laughs> and like, that's why. Like, you know, he, he was selling something so different, a concept so different to anything you've ever heard and that is what brand's all about. It's about differentiation. But do you feel like it's, there's a signaling aspect to it? You know, like I have, I have friends who deliberately drive nice cars because if they show up to meeting in not nice cars, they know. And they'd much rather rock. We had this conversation the other day. Like, yeah. you'd, you know, you'd much rather rock the Volkswagen. Like, you don't really care about the flashy car or the watch. But at a certain point, like, there's a signaling in, you know, to, to a status symbol where if Liver King, for example, was you know, lying through his Cheshire cat fucking veneer teeth and was doing it on a Nokia, you'd be like, this guy is insane and he's like living in the woods, but he's got like the big house and here's my family. It's like, oh, like these are all signals to success, which I think was what good brands do really well, right? Like if you look at like the Porsche, right? Jay's like a big Porsche guy. Like the Porsche, Porsche. Porsche nailed charging more for less because what they're actually selling you is the status. Right, like if Liver King was in a hut, like you want to go go big on the brand, go big. You want to like eat fucking bowl balls or whatever the fuck he was doing, like then do it in a wood shack in the middle of the fucking I don't know the the Angola desert or something. But he did it in like a eight bedroom house in like the south end of Chicago or the north end of Chicago or wherever the fuck he lived. Right? Do you feel as if like there's an obligation to signal? to acquire like the broader audience. Like there's no way, scale means you're reaching people that you know you wouldn't otherwise reach. Like if I just sat around my nerdy round table and my tripod on my chiropractic table pointing at a whiteboard, there's no way we'd be here. So, but the thing is it's the audience. So yeah, the way exactly. that I see it, it's the audience. Look at Sam's look, he's got a younger generation who kind of, they're not gonna be appeased by the flashiness. They like seeing the raw shit of him talking shit in his car on the way to the gym. Liver King, the product that he was selling is at a, I would say a higher market. It's more the older males who low testosterone and how can I bring all these things up? They've got the money. It's like that doesn't appease a 20 year old, for example. Right. It's like there's, there's two different markets that you're now looking at or playing with. Yeah, and that, that's what I was saying. With, that's where the relativity is. Yeah. It's like, you know, it, it honestly just depends who you're selling to. And that changes over time. You know, like as you get towards it, like with Liver King, he probably didn't, you know, I mean, he might have started that way, but like, if you want to, uh, you the the way to build a business is to really target a corner of a market as hard as you can, right? So you don't go for the whole thing, because then you can't differentiate and you can't compete with the people that already have the monopoly on that. So you go for the corner, and then once you get the corner, you start taking ground, and taking ground is the ability to broaden the audience, right? And so, I'll give you an example, like. Maybe the reason that a lot of creators do scale up their quality is because there's a particular, the, the people who started from day one, the OGs that you mentioned, like that are watching you guys filming on, you know, whatever it was, you know, that's a particular segment. Of, that's like, uh, we, we, we built something to help us understand where we think we're at and we call this, cre we call it creator commerce. And it's this idea that the worlds of content and commerce are colliding. And that was the whole preface why I like dropped everything and just started this business was like, there's something here, this market is small, but it is going to get bigger. And it's this notion that when you look at like a Kimmy K. <laughs> I'm going to interject Whoa. for my friends here. Who the hell are you talking about? Huh? Who is Kim that? K. Kim Kardashian. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. Christ. All right. Oh, cool. my God. I, I stand by this and no <laughs> one believes me. She could walk in this room right now. I have no idea what she looks like. Well, Look, <laughs> look her up. Okay. She's like, my point is, it's like, Kim okay, I'll use K. another one. Mr. Beast, Logan Paul. Yeah. These, these are the companies that are creator-led businesses that have built-in distribution in terms of like marketing and attention. That is what I believe to be the next iteration, you know, and I think we've seen that. And the technology adoption life cycle, have you, you've seen that? Like, um, yes, yeah. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but you've got like the early adopters. Yeah, and mark, it, market penetration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, but you, you know, you think about it and I think creators were the first iteration. They were like the real early days of this creator commerce adoption cycle. And I think the second iteration is brands and companies coming into this space because they see the success. 
and then there'll just be people that are too late, right? And so I think the idea is, is that like everybody started somewhere and they usually start at that corner of the market and then, you know, once you've captured that corner of the market, like you were saying, like Liver King, even though it's not a premium product, like it's not a Porsche, yeah. right? So like a Porsche, there's only going to be a particular set of people in the world that are going to be able to, that are going to want that. You know, like for me, that's not something I'll ever want, no matter how much money I make. I just don't think it's not, it's, I'm not a car guy, first of all, but second of all, like, I don't know, it's not something that I would want. So there's a particular psychology they're looking for. So my point is, is like, when you are a creator and in the early days of content creation, which is where the, a lot of these creator-led businesses start, that they may not be doing hi-fi content and they're lo-fi. So there is the OGs, there is these people that are like, I'm fine with that. Now, if I wanna penetrate a market, my content, which is my distribution, plays a significant role in my ability to do that because I need to get the attention of that market, right? So. If I want to, and, and maybe maybe the next iteration or the next piece of ground that you want to take is that higher market and they are going to respect the hi-fi content, oh, yeah. right? So I think my point initially was, I don't think you have to start there. I think the natural occurrence happens because you want to grow your market. And I think just as a broad comment, like we now are so used to the hi-fi content on YouTube, which is the new TV, that if you want to capture that market, you kind of have to go down that path. Now, Sam Sulek well, is the, different. Yeah, he's the is, but, but, but you know, there is more people in the world at that particular market, the low fi the low price point, there is much more of those people in the world, right? So that's why I think low fi content, and it all depends what you talk about and there's more, much more nuance to this conversation, but I think the lo-fi content actually has a greater chance of going viral than the hi-fi. Well, you can always scale up. So the thing is like with the lo-fi content, you can always, as the brand develops and as you develop, your first YouTube video that I know from you is the dial stick. When you take the dial stick rotation for, yeah, do you remember yeah, that? Yeah. PTSD, but yeah. Yeah, sick. But the idea behind that is look how the evolution has occurred and the brand has then occurred with it at the same time. You can't have started where we are now and go backwards. I think to kind of bring, I like the term creator um, commerce because I look at it and I think we're basing this off the assumption that a creator has larger business scale operation or aspirations, yeah. right? Because I think yeah. just like normal business, because when you, you made the idea of you know early adopters into you know, peak market penetration and looking at, um, you know, looking at what companies will do in other aspects of their business, right? Like um, uh, instance that comes to mind is Google buying uh, or meta buying WhatsApp. It's like here you have this platform with so many users, it'd be too hard to replicate it in house. Like I really, when I see brands going the creator route, I see them do, doing that in the same way Meta went the messenger route. It's like, well, messenger sucks, WhatsApp is better, it's international, it's encrypted, you can still go to jail, don't message about drugs <laughs> on WhatsApp, just so everyone's clear, PSA. But at the end of the day, it's like, businesses are always gonna do what they're going to do, right? Whether you're gonna acquire a new platform, like Meta acquired WhatsApp, or you're just gonna acquire a creator. I think most creators are still falling in. Like, I feel like creators either lack direction, motivation, or the autonomy or the system to really go corporate because corporate just comes in with too great an incentive, right? Like someone, whoever owned WhatsApp originally, uh, and I'm sure you probably know who the name of the guy, probably had it on the fucking show, but I'm sure he could still be running a really, really profitable business, but they just gave him a deal that they, that they couldn't refuse, right? And I feel like creators are just doing that. I feel like the relationship has changed just re relative to uh, a different orientation like it's still just when i watch like apple for example apple what took out brought out their fitness product how does apple fitness or nike fitness pick their coaches that go out it's they're just, they're just going in and buying eyeballs why because that's what they're always gonna do right because I, I think one thing that's been interesting is like the idea of a key man clause like we look at that across our business and we go you know in our operations does does someone have a particular advantage that would leave us 
behind the eight ball if we were to ever, ever sell? Like, does our does our CTO? Is it me? Is it Jay? Is there someone in the business that that can't be replaced and that actually decreases the value in the eyes of an investor? And it's like, you know, for a long time I pushed back on that as far as like, hey, like let's try and pull back, pull back. But if you and I'm going to pose this as a question to I mean to all of you, but I'd be interested in your opinion first, Kyle. Is if Elon Musk were to step down from Tesla, pay, PayPal, and SpaceX tomorrow, what would the value of those companies go to? 